Good morning. Welcome to worship at First Presbyterian Church. My name is Marietta Macy. I know that you, my face is getting more familiar to many of you, but I am the Associate Pastor of Christian Education. And I'm delighted to be here with you all as Bill and Margie are still enjoying their time away. So we send them continued good wishes. One announcement I wanted to make this morning, normally we would be, as many of you expected, celebrating communion today. But since it is me that is here, who is not technically yet ordained, uh, I am not able to serve communion yet. Um, I've never been ordained as an elder or a deacon, and I went straight to the ordination path. So we are waiting for me to serve communion in good Presbyterian fashion, decently and in order, after all of the officialness is official, uh, after I'm ordained. So that's why we're not celebrating this morning. So we can hold that spirit of communion in our hearts um, as, as we miss the technical elements this morning. Uh, a couple other announcements. You can check out the ones in the, uh, on the green sheet, but also what we missed getting in was that Covenant House is still in need of diapers. Um, so you can drop those off here at the church and we'll deliver them, or you can drop them off at Covenant House directly. Uh, all sizes of diapers are needed. So if you're able, please donate. God is good. All the time. Praise be to God, the Creator, who breathes life into being. Praise be to God, the Redeemer, who saves us from ourselves. Praise be to God, the Sustainer, who binds us together as one body. Come, children of the triune God, come worship our wild and wonderful Maker.
Try as we might, we know this week we have fallen short in many ways of the glory of God. Let us confess together. One God of endless mercy, we have often been swallowed up by our greed and selfishness, desiring that which we do not have, filling our lives with things that do not save us. We have often been swept away by the floods of our own making, polluting your creation, neglecting to be faithful stewards of the earth. We have often attacked one another and led lives of violence, sending missiles instead of accepting refugees, ignoring your commandments. Loving God, have mercy, for we have sinned and fallen short of your glory. Christ, have mercy, for we are broken and need your salvation. Lord, have mercy upon us and hear us as we pray. Amen. Beloved sisters, brothers, siblings in Christ, God has heard our plea for forgiveness and offers us mercy in abundance. Our sins have been forgiven. Rejoice and be at peace. Alleluia. Amen. As Jesus has shown us joy and peace in community, let us share signs of that peace with one another. May the peace of Christ be with you. listen for the word of God. Come, the reading this morning, the first reading comes from the book of Genesis, verses 1 through 14. It's a well-known story. After these things, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham. And he said, here I am. And he said, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Moriah, and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains that I will show you. So Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey, and took two of his young men with him and his son Isaac. He cut the wood for the burnt offering and set out and went to the place in the distance that God had shown him. On the third day, Abraham looked up and saw the place far away. Then Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey. The boy and I will go over there. We will worship, and then we will come back to you. Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on his son Isaac, and he himself carried the fire and the knife. So the two of them walked on together, and Isaac said to his father, Father, and he said, Here I am, son. 
And he said, the fire and the wood are here, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God himself will provide the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. When they came to the place that God had shown him, Abraham built the altar there and laid wood in order. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then Abraham reached out his hand and took the knife to kill his son. But the angel of the Lord called him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here I am. He said, do not lay your hand on the boy or do anything to him. For I now know that you fear God, since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. And Abraham looked up and saw a ram caught in the thicket by its horns. Abraham, uh, Abraham went and took the ram and offered it up as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called the place the Lord will provide. As it is said to this day, on the mount of the Lord it shall be provided. Thanks be to God. Our second scripture reading this morning is from Matthew. Chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. Whoever welcomes you welcomes me, and whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of these will lose their reward. The word of God for the people of God. The children are welcome to join me up front.
Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Good. Are we all awake this morning? No. Yeah, great. <laughs> I'm kind of in the same boat. That's okay. Do you all know that, that part of the service that we did earlier where we get up and shake hands with everybody and we say, peace be with you, or we say good morning, we say welcome, that used to be one of my least favorite parts of the service because I was very shy, especially when I was really all of girls' age, and I didn't like to get up and say good morning to everybody and have to shake their hands. But now it's actually one of my favorite parts of the service because I really like to see everybody's bright shining smiles after not seeing you possibly for a week and say good morning and say I hope you're having a good day and share a little bit of love with people. But there are some folks I did not get to say good morning to. So I need your all's help this morning. I have some welcome hearts that I need to pass out to people. Can you all help me with that? Do you want to go, we're going to walk around, do you want to go together or do you all want to split up? Everybody get some. You can hand them to anybody. You can say good morning if you want. You can just smile and hand them if you're shy and don't want to say anything. Let's walk around together and hand them out. Let's start over here. You can hand them to anybody that you see. Welcome, John. Welcome, Marie. Thank you. We've got to spread them out, so let's keep going, too. We don't have enough for everybody, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> see some other people back here that maybe need a welcome. Yes, you need a welcome. Do we have any more? You ran out, that's okay. We have one more. We got another welcome. Thank you all. Let's go back up front together. Now, I know you all think that was pretty easy to do, right? Oh, we got one more as an example. But what we just did was actually something really special. Did you know that Jesus was there the whole time? Did you see him? No. But the scripture that we just read in the Bible, when you say welcome to somebody in a loving way that you care about, it's the same as welcoming Jesus. It's the same as saying hello, good morning, and smiling to Jesus. So when you all just shared those hearts with everybody and said welcome, it's just like you were saying good morning to Jesus. So it's pretty easy. I hope that you all could share God's love with somebody this week. You're not in school right now, but maybe if you meet somebody new at school and welcome them, that would be a really good way to share God's love. Let's pray together. Holy One, we thank you for sharing your love. Help us welcome you in all the faces and shapes and sizes. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. Thank you all for joining me. So, we're on episode four today of this season of Abraham shenanigans. Since we heard the passage a few weeks ago where the story all started of God telling Abram to go from his country and your kindred, I'll make a great nation of you, I will bless you, and all that. From his initial call in Genesis 12, Abraham's been on a journey that's both physical and spiritual. As his life continues to unfold, He's been learning more and more about the nature of God and what it means to trust God. As we've discussed with some of his previous episodes, there have been doubts and mistakes, questions, but overall there's been a deepening in his relationship with God. As good as that overall progress sounds, though, if you, like me, are still left with some questions, some quandaries about this 
test put before Abraham today. It's an uncomfortable story. So first, how could Abraham sacrifice his own son, who he'd waited for and wanted for so long? It doesn't really seem like parent of the year material here, much less to be a divinely chosen by God ancestor of all the nations. To give Abraham some grace, though, we should note that the ritual offerings of animals and people were common at the time throughout this region. And this isn't even the only story of child sacrifice in the Bible. And while upsetting either way, it wouldn't have seemed the same type of shocking to Abraham and Sarah as it does to us for a God to demand such a sacrifice. But this should also give us an idea of the kind of religious scene that Adonai was trying to make, was making themselves known in. It's a brutal and messy world then and now for us all to seek the grace and mercy of God. And a second question this story raises. What kind of God would demand such a sacrifice? Why would God do that? It sounds petty and vengeful and bloodthirsty and hardly worthy of praise, let alone trust and love. As a test to Abraham, this sounds cruel and malicious. Not to mention, this is Sarah's only son, who her worth and security relied on, and who risked her life to birth him into the world. Why would God go to the trouble to promise this medical miracle of a child to Sarah and Abraham in their old age? A child that God promises will be the beginning of a line of nations that Abraham will be the father of. And a child that has had another mother and child banished so that they can prosper on his behalf. Only to have this child be killed as a sacrifice. It's just not a good look, honestly, for God. But it's important to remember that Genesis is not written to be read as a news report. This is a text of a people that are looking back at their history and trying to put together the stories and occurrences that made them who they are and got them to where they were. These stories are part of a collective memory, more so than a textbook history. It's a struggle I'm sure we can still identify with, that of a people trying to make sense of who God is, who they are, and what that all means for their lives. It can be helpful to look at stories set in this period especially, really any time, but especially in this period, with as much context as we can get, and imagine what it would mean for people who composed the story and first told it before we project our full modern judgment onto the story. Knowing or at least imagining what it would have meant to them can help us discern how this scripture is still speaking to and informing us today. So let's set the social context a bit more for the time. Not only is this still a new relationship between Abraham and God, God being known at all as the God that we all recognize today is new. This is early in the timeline of the establishment of the people of Israel and the worship of one God. So there is still a lot of questions to work out at this point in their story. Abraham and Sarah especially got a lot of the initial figuring it out put on their shoulders. It was much more common at the time to worship multiple gods. There are some that we know, like those, ancient Egyptian, those in ancient Egyptian lore, who Abraham and Sarah would have been familiar with, I'm sure, from their time there, and were perhaps those that Hagar grew up with before she met and named the one holy god, El Roy, the one who sees. There were other Canaanite gods named in the Bible too, but there were also tons of much smaller local gods, tribal family and household deities. So there were tons of options. So for the community of the one God we know to distinguish itself on the religious and cultural scene of the ancient world and in written record, it had to set itself apart. Repeatedly, scripture tells stories of God intervening in ways that let the people know, I'm not like other gods. I do things differently. And today's still troubling reading is no different. 
the same Sunday that we started Abraham's journey, we also heard about the calling of Matthew, the, the disciple. And it's something that Jesus said at dinner in that reading that came back to me while I was praying over this scripture for this Sunday about what sets God apart. And in Matthew 9:10, the story begins, while Jesus was having dinner at Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners came and ate with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they asked his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? On hearing this, Jesus said, it is not the healthy who need a doctor, but the sick. But go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. And it kept repeating for me as an answer to this Genesis reading. This line that Jesus is quoting here comes from Hosea 6.6, 6, so he's not the first one to say this. In another translation, the whole verse in Hosea reads, For I desire steadfast love and not sacrifice, the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. So this is not the only time that God upends the social religious norms of the day. The book of the prophet Hosea centers on God's unending love toward their people, even though they have sinfully turned to worshiping other Canaanite gods. The prophet calls them back into full relationship with the one God, who we are called to remember is quite different than those other petty deities who, among other differences, can be satisfied with perfect formulaic material offerings. And we still live in a society that worships many gods. And I don't mean the differently named God of our siblings of other faiths, but the petty self-made idols that demand costly sacrifices. It's upsetting to name, but we're really no strangers to child sacrifice, even though it looks a bit different these days and in our history. We've sacrificed our children on altars of economic progress, on monetary gain, of power and prestige. We've already sacrificed the future grandchildren and children will have to climate change, who will experience more hazy, smoky days like we did this week. We've sacrificed our children to our love of guns and the false, shallow freedom we're convinced they provide. We've sacrificed our children when their childhoods become adulthoods because they're forced to raise themselves and their siblings as the adults meant to raise them are overworked, under-resourced, unsupported, incapable, or downright dangerous to them. We've sacrificed our children on the battlefield unnecessarily and recklessly when we've fought for wealth and control instead of freedom and liberation. We've sacrificed the indigenous children of this land on genocidal theology and colonial greed. We sacrificed the children of Africa when they were brought here as enslaved people to carry the weight of building a nation on their backs, only to watch their own children continue to be sacrificed before their eyes. These sacrifices are antithetical to the love and mercy God prefers and yet we need to be honest about their part in our story. As we look forward this week, especially to celebrating the anniversary of our founding of a nation, when we remember freedom and independence and prosperity, we've got stories in our history we'd rather not tell to, because they make us ask questions we'd rather sometimes not have the answers to and not have to ponder. But we need to wrestle with these truths. We need to include the stories that teach us about ourselves, even the things that we might not like to know, so that we can do better, so that we can live into the way that our loving creator intends for everyone. We have done great things in our history collectively, and I look forward to more of them, and I will celebrate that this week. Those great things happen, though, when we are grounded in the gospel of love and mercy. The story of Abraham and Isaac causes acute disease from multiple angles, but we can learn from these feelings themselves because they're appropriate feelings to have. Part of the lasting discomfort with the story is that this is not the God that we know. It seems out of character, because it is. 
we've observed a pattern of Creator's behavior of love and compassion for others coming first, of bringing life out of death and wanting health and wholeness for their people. So this abrupt shift feels jarring because it is. Whether God ever demanded this of Abraham, God sets God's self apart by demanding mercy, not death, destruction, or sacrifice. Like so many stories in scripture, this is another one where a big part of the lesson we are to learn is the questions that it leaves us with. And as we try to answer them for ourselves, we need to examine what our inclinations say about us and our relationship with God as individuals and as a church. Just like our ancestors of the faith, editing scripture together, selecting the stories that gave them their identity, wrestling with this story reminds us that God is not like any other God or idol humans have imagined and made up. Creator is so far beyond our imagination that it is a relief. Whether Abraham ever really almost sacrificed Isaac or not, we, as God's people, needed this story to help us set God apart from our small human notions of the divine. Adonai is a God who desires life, not death, abundance, not scarcity, faith over fear, and mercy, not sacrifice. Amen.
We have a few joys and concerns to share this morning. First, I want to share the news that Tom Sprock passed away Thursday. And Vicki, we are holding you and your whole family in our prayers. We know that this is a great loss, but also hope that the love and peace of God that surpasses all understanding will wrap around you and your family during this time. We also want to lift up in prayer Robin Harlow and Jeff as he cares for her. She's been in and out of the hospital over the last uh, several days. She's home now, I believe, but we want to continue to lift them up in prayer. We also want to continue to lift up Joe Copenhaver and Beth as he still struggles with his health issues as well, and Beth with caring for him. Joys this morning, we look forward to celebrating the 4th of July this week. I'm sure that many of you are gathering with family and friends, uh, and we celebrate as well the festiveness and uh, community that is around the celebration of regatta this weekend, and so we offer prayers of thanksgiving and joy for that, but also of prayers for safe celebrations for everyone. Let's join in prayer. God of all the earth, we call on you because we know you will answer. Hear us now. It seems like all the powers of the world are working together and making plans against the well-being of your beloved people. The forces of division set the strong against the weak and exploit our need to care for those closest to us. Reveal your enduring strength that rises up within human communities. Insecurity and uncertainty drive us to hoard the good things of life. Help us open our clenched fists, restore our depleted earth, and join us to one another. God, so often violence, illness, poverty, and death pursue us. We lift up especially those who we named today who are dealing with illness and loss. Drive away everything that takes away life and send forth the healing power and comforting power of your name and love. Let all the world know that the grace of your reign, for you alone are the sovereign of all. And we pray all these things through our Lord Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray, saying, Creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. As God has been generous to us, let us be generous with what we have received. Please share your offerings this morning.
Let's pray together. God of abundance, you have blessed us greatly and richly and lovingly. Help us to use our gifts, all of the variety of gifts you have given us, to your grace and to your glory. Share these we have shared today with those in greatest need. Help our resources get to those who seem to be lacking. Help us even out systems that keep those in need. Bless us all with the abundance that you intend for everyone. We ask all these things in your many names. Amen. in fact, standing on the promises, and it is a strong and sure foundation. And one of those promises, among many others, is that God desires mercy, not sacrifice. Go out into the world this week, knowing that you are the people of a God who created all things good, that you are the people of a Holy Spirit who speaks actively to us and guides us each day, and you are the people of a Savior who taught us how to live when we forget and it feels too hard and complicated. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>